The company plan, as it were, was an A3 bit of paper that was on my wall in the office when I arrived. And I looked at it and I was confused. I'm inherently quite a commercial animal. <laughs> Creating a space where people want to live, not go to die. What do you see as the big changes that are happening in the world and how do you think they're going to affect your industry? Uh, the baby boomer is the biggest population there has ever been in Western society. Um, we know that there are more baby boomers coming than any other generation before, but what's most profound about it is their view on the world. It is completely different from their parents. You know, in, in the not too distant past, over 65 was considered old. If you tell a 65 year old they're old today, you better be able to run pretty quick. And so for us to change, to adapt, to evolve, to make sure we actually stay relevant into the future with a very different customer, it's a, a huge challenge and a really exciting opportunity. Like what drove you to come and work for MetLife Care? So I was uh, CEO at Housing New Zealand at the time. And if I'm really honest, I came to realise that the public sector wasn't where I wanted to spend the rest of my career. I'm inherently quite a commercial animal. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to be just sitting on a dinghy, rising on an incoming tide of demographic trends. So when you moved here, you started with quite a clear idea that you wanted to take this industry into a new area. How did you communicate that to everybody here? One of the very best things I did when I joined the organisation and smartest things in hindsight was I negotiated with my predecessor, the outgoing CEO, that he would hold the fort for three weeks when I started and I spent the first three weeks visiting every one of our 24 villages, meeting our, meeting our residents, meeting our staff, so I asked lots and lots of questions. I asked mostly the same questions everywhere I went. What were the questions you asked? What is our strength? What makes this village unique and special? What do our customers value most about it? Who's the competition? What are their strengths relative to ours? And so it was just really trying to get a very basic understanding of how the whole thing fit together. Because once you get into a role, the ability to create the time to go and spend all that time out in the business is pretty tricky. So what did you discover in asking those questions? Each village was operating as its own autonomous little business. That we were not leveraging a common base of knowledge well enough. The other thing I learned was that we have an extraordinarily passionate staff at MetLife Care. People come to work and they give it out. That I came away with thinking, wow, this is fantastic because you can't create that, you can't fabricate it. So how did you go from that to building the vision for MetLife Care? The company plan, as it were, was an A3 bit of paper that was on my wall in the office when I arrived. And I looked at it and I was confused. We distilled it down to three things. The first was customer experience, accelerated growth, and the third thing was commercial intensity. Is this the right commercial thing? Is it going to drive a right outcome? Um, be it for an investor, for our residents, for our staff. But our challenge now is if we think about our future customer and where this business is going to go, what does success look like in 10 years? At the moment you haven't defined whether you'd call it a purpose statement or a vision statement or a why or any of those things. Personally I like the idea of calling it our ambition because to, to me I find that a much more empowering exciting way of describing it because ambition doesn't mean we've all you know got to be highly ambitious people but I think every human on the planet inherently has some level of ambition. How are you coming up with what that ambition might be. So what I've most recently done was I did a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with each of our directors, board members, and I asked them three questions and I said the conversation can't go for more than 30 minutes. What do we want MetLife Care to be famous for? Why do we exist um, other than to generate shareholder value? And how ambitious or uncomfortable are we prepared to be? And the thing that's been consistent with everyone is a real desire to, to drive innovation. 
So how do you get innovative within that space? Because it seems to me that almost a lot of what is great is actually going back to basics. You know, ultimately we're, you know, we're creating a roof over people's heads. And so we're looking in terms of how we design and build villages now, how do we make them more, I guess, permeable with the communities that we're part of? and so that people can participate as much or as, as little as they like. But we're not kind of stuck behind a wall. We know that sociability is a huge issue, so how do we create environments that families actually, unlike when we went to see elderly relatives in a rest home, we couldn't wait to get out of there, create an environment where the grandkids actually want to come and spend time with their grandparents. Creating a space where people want to live not go to die. We can only achieve all of this through our people. It's our people that are interacting with our residents in the village each and every day that bring us to life. Unlocking and unleashing our people to be themselves and to be their best and to giving them permission to be their authentic true selves. Hello. Oh, so what do you have? Gazpacho soup? Yeah, with cream fresh Ooh. and um, no, amazing. No, no. What role do you think you play specifically in terms of creating that kind of a culture? A huge lesson for me coming into the role of CEO for the first time is you are under a microscope constantly. And so the importance of me modelling with our staff and with our residents the sort of leadership traits or human interactions that you want to see created through the business. It's actually taking time for as long as they want to stop and chat. Have a laugh, kind of don't take yourself too seriously. Um, all those things and be, being honest and authentic. What do you think then are the qualities of a great leader? It's being as good a listener as a talker. In fact probably a better listener than a talker. And that's something I've had to work on. The most important traits in a leader is to have a very high level of curiosity. How do things work? Why are they how they are? I wonder what if? And to have high standards, you know, to basically say this is what we want to be good at and this is what good looks like, to communicate that and to actually be really focused on on taking people towards that. Where do those traits come from, do you think? Are you, were you born with them? Have you learnt them? I've asked myself that a lot. I, um, if I look back, I, I grew up in, a, in Wellington. I did okay at high school. No one in my family had been to university. We were essentially a family of tradespeople. And so when I left school, I went and became an electrician. But what was really interesting was I realised over time that that wasn't fulfilling my curiosity or my desire to grow. Probably the most uh, formative part of my life, I was extremely lucky in my very early 20s to, uh, to be picked by Peter Black to sail around the world as a 22 year old. And I spent the next decade doing Whitbreads in America's Cups and things like that. And when I look back, I was attending a master class in leadership and strategy. And I loved the competition. You know, it's a bit, you know, I look at you know, what makes a great thoroughbred race force. Inherently, I think they just like competing. So then it would be talent combined with passion. Absolutely, one without the other. You know, people really succeed in life when you merge talent and ambition. I've known many, many people with way more talent than I've got but perhaps without the same drive or ambition or willingness to take risks. You know, opportunity passes by a lot of people in life. And it's how your willingness to take a risk and to try and embrace that opportunity, I think that often um, defines ultimately what happens to us and where we go. How do you nurture that within the people here? I think it's um, understanding what drives and motivates people uh, supporting, nurturing that. Sometimes it requires a debate about if we got the balance right, but empowering and enabling people to be creative, to be stretchy. I'd much rather say, well, I think we're going a bit far then, than me being behind pushing. You know, I had a passion for sailing. I fell into being an electrician, realised that's 
not what I wanted to be for the rest of my life. And I've had a number of different career changes essentially, but all of them have been about growing, being prepared to take a risk, embrace an opportunity, and being highly curious. What advice would you give your 18 year old self if you could go back in time? Ooh. That's a really good question. That's a really good question. I think career-wise, be brave, be bold, be a warm, decent person. Focus on your personal relationships and the value of those. As you get older, I think we learn how important and valuable they are. That's probably, that's probably what I tell myself.